Hello there. My name is Leo Marchini and I am a dentist and an assistant professor in the geriatric and special needs clinic of the University of Iowa College of Dentistry and Dental Clinics. Today, we will be talking about the topic cognitive impairment and oral health. So I would like to show you my disclosure statement. So I, Leo Marchini, do not have any financial interests or relationships with any manufacturers of products or providers of services I might be discussing in my presentation. I have no financial relationship with any of the companies supporting this educational event, and I will not discuss any pharmaceuticals, medical procedures, or devices that are investigational or unapproved for use by the FDA. So, all of you know that cognitive impairment could be caused by different <clears throat> etiology factors. Like we have the irreversible ones, like the vascular dementia, the Parkinson disease, Lewis body disease, Alzheimer disease. And we also have the reversible causes of cognitive impairment, like infections, nutritional deficiency, endocrine, endocrine problems, and others. But what we are going to talk today is about how this cognitive impairment may harm the oral health of our patients. So, as you know, cognitive impaired patients will present memory loss, loss of executive functions like having more difficulty on making decisions, organizing complex activities, and others. So, when they do have this kind of problems, when cognitive impaired patients begin to present its early symptoms, they also will lose their ability to perform adequate oral hygiene and report oral problems. So, with that, they usually will present poor oral hygiene, they can also present xerostomia or dry mouth due to the medications they are taking. They will have much more dental plaque accumulation. They can present bleeding gums due to poor, poor oral health. They can have big calculus build up on their teeth. And they can also present rampant caries that could lead to tooth loss and oral facial pain. So, it is not uncommon at all to find demented patients with very, very poor oral health, presenting decay, gum disease and problems, calculus buildup, plaque buildup. I think it's something all of you have seen before. However, New research is also showing that oral health can impact cognitive impairment progression. Oral health problems usually have, are caused by polymicrobial and diseases that keep a chronic infection into patient's mouth. We frequent episodes of bacteremia. So these problems can cause atherogenesis and can also cause a chronic inflammatory response that will increase the inflammatory markers. All those things can lead to an inflammatory condition of the brain and help on vascular dementia due to atherogenesis. There are some studies also looking to the relationship between dietary changes due to tooth loss and its impact on progression of cognitive impairment. However, these studies are still in a very embryonary phases, phase, and we cannot really establish causal relationships yet. Okay, so due to the problems we mentioned before, our contents for today will cover how cognitive impairment can impact oral health. How does it happen? What 
really happens with the patient that leads them to a poor oral health condition. And if it does happen, why bother? Why should we be concerned about our patients presenting a poorer oral health condition? And if it's important, how can we improve oral health for these patients? In the other hand, we will be also talking about how oral health can impact cognitive impairment. As we told, there is several new current theories that establish such a relationship. Although they are not proving causal relationship yet, they are worth a look at. So we are going to do that by the end of this presentation. Well, our first topic will be how does cognitive impairment affect oral health? To answer this question in a proper way, we should understand the etiology of oral diseases and how cognitive impairment impacts oral disease progression. By doing so, we will be able to figure out why the epidemiology of oral diseases among our cognitively impaired patients is so concerning. Our first topic is the etiology of oral diseases. The most common oral diseases among the elderly and also among other populations are caries and periodontal disease. So here you have an example of patients suffering from several cavities in his mouth. And here you have a patient where there was an extensive amount of bony loss and gingival inflammation. It's usually caused by calculus and plaque buildup. How does cognitive impairment can affect oral health regarding to caries? So let's take a close look on the etiology of caries. So to get into a state like we sh showed before with a in a patient with several cavities in his mouth, we need to have three factors working together. The first one will be the presence of bacteria. So we need plaque buildup on the patient's teeth. This plaque should harbor pathogenic bacteria. These bacteria should not only be pathogenic, but they can, they should be also a specific bacteria to cause caries. Removable dentures can uh, have a negative effect as they can harbor pathogenic bacteria, as fixed bridges also do. But if we do frequent plaque removal or on both natural or artificial teeth, we can preclude caries progression. But as you know, our cognitively impaired patients cannot do that efficiently. We can also use antibacterial agents to fight against bacteria. The other factor will be diet. These bacteria need sugar to metabolize in acids to be able to produce caries to cavitate our teeth. So they need sugar in regular frequency and amount. If we use sugar substitutes though, that's gonna preclude the development of cavities. But if the food is in a soft consistency and is really sticky, it will be more favorable to caries progression. So as you know, our cognitively impaired patient usually have a very sugary diet and in a softy consistency and sometimes it's really sticky. So we should address those issues also. And the third and final factor is the patient. With that we mean that the patient needs to have a tooth morphology that allows bacteria to uh, colonize it easily, these patients are going to present more caries. And also, 
we can affect the resistance of the tooth by adding fluoride to the patient's mouth, increasing the resistance of the tooth against decay. The presence of tooth fillings usually increase the rate of tooth decay. Saliva has a protective effect against tooth decay. If the patient is able to do a good job on oral hygiene, so that's going to be a plus. But to do that, patients should be able to hold a toothbrush, comply to oral hygiene regimens, and sometimes patients need help. If they need help and present a combative behavior, those patients are less likely to get good oral hygiene. So those are the factors the cognitive impairment will affect the patient ability to fight against caries. How about periodontal disease, though? Periodontal disease can be divided in two very different categories. The first one is gingivitis. For that one, you don't brush your teeth for a longer period of time. It's certain that you are going to get gingivitis. With that, I mean 100% of the patients that are not brushing their teeth for a week will we we present gingivitis at some point. Gingivitis is characterized by bleeding of the gums and some discomfort and some redness around the teeth. If it's not treated, a percentage of the patients presenting gingivitis are going to develop a more extensive disease that's called periodontal disease and that one include bone loss that will lead to tooth mobility and possible tooth loss. How gingivites that everybody can will present if not tooth brushing can evolve to periodontal disease in some patients? It depends on again bacteria very pathogenic bacteria and very specific bacteria. Again, removable prosthesis and fixed prosthesis can negatively affect the development of periodontal disease. And if we do frequent plaque removal, we can prevent it. As far as we can do that using antibacterial agents too. Although antibacterial agents are not so effective as frequent plaque removal is. And again, we have the patient, but now it's not that related to the patient's tooth, but it's related to the host response. So patients that are immunocompromised will have a tendency to have to present more periodontal disease. It depends on patient habits, many those related to oral hygiene. Systemic diseases like per periodontal disease is closely related to diabetes. So patients presenting diabetes usually have a worse periodontal disease than other patients without diabetes. Saliva plays an important role on periodontal disease development as does oral hygiene. That depends on ability to hold a tough brush, compliance to oral hygiene uh, regimens, and sometimes those patients need help. And if those patients need help and they present a combative behavior, they will be less likely to have good oral hygiene. Okay, so now that we know more about the etiology of caries and, and periodontal disease, we can see how cognitive impairment is going to affect the development of auto diseases. So patients with cognitive impairment, as we have talked before, will present memory impairment, if aphasia, apraxia, agnosia, behavioral problems that usually are handled using medication that can lead to xerostomia, and they sometimes rely in other people to help having their auto hygiene. And they also sometimes are not able to do frequent 
dentist visits because they their financial restraints. All of those things can lead to poor oral hygiene, zero stomach, mouth, dry mouth, and more plaque accumulation. As you know, poor oral hygiene, dry mouth, and plaque accumulation can lead to gingivites and caries. And for some patients, gingivites are going to develop on periodontal disease. Well, how that translates to the epidemiology of oral disease among demented patients. With that I mean, how cognitive impaired patients compare to other groups regarding oral health? Well, let's take a look on that. In this work, they have done research in older adults with dementia living in different environments. So, in the first group, we have community dwelling patients. In the second group, assisted living. And the third group, nursing home patients. So as you can see, they have a huge number of medical conditions and the nursing home patients will have even higher number of medical conditions. They are on several medications, and again, nursing home will be the group who, with the higher number of medication taken daily, and they have moderate to severe cognitive impairment in about a half of the patients in nursing homes and about a, in nursing homes and community, and about a third in assisted living. These patients are usually cooperative to care, but some of them are usually uncooperative. Many of these patients need supervision or help when performing auto hygiene. And those patients present a pretty high number of cavities in their mouth. So the community dwelling ones will have 5.5 in average. Assisted living 5.3 and nursing homes 6 cavities. Regarding calculs, plaque, or gingival bleeding, the vast majority will present small to median calculus, plaque, and gingival bleeding on all groups. Is that a problem only for the American people? No, this is a worldwide problem. In Germany, when we are considering institutionalized older people, you can see right away that on both dementia groups and non-dementia groups, the plaque index and the denture hygiene index are really poor, even more in the dementia group. Is that a problem of the developed world? No. In Brazil, they also have that kind of problem. Like, does the patient have any problems when we are looking at an Alzheimer population? Yes, they do for about a third. And do they have uh, frequent dental visits or dental appointments? The answer is no for the vast majority. So it's a common problem worldwide. Our next topic, we'll be talking about why worry about cognitively impaired patients' oral health. So we see that the oral health is bad, but why bother? Well, there are several reasons to bother. We have systemic problems that can come with oral health problems, and we also have the reduced quality of life in patients with bad oral health. And we also have the social appearance. Well, you will say some of these patients will not care about that at all. Yes, but sometimes their family does. And, you know, in art, when they are representing the old, the ugly, like in this winter representation from Giuseppe Arcimbaldo, an Italian artist, they represent that with a typical edentate profile, a typical edentate mouth. 
And when they are representing the spring, the elf, the beautiful, they do have a dentate face, a dentate profile. So as we have seen before, research conducted during the last decades presented poor oral health and increased dental caries experience and more dental problems in older adults with dementia. It's a fact. So we know that it's going on. And most of professionals involved in other older adults care know that. But the question is, why bother? Is that real a real problem? Well, if we have caries in a patient's mouth, caries can lead both to orofacial pain, an emergency situation where the patient needs to look for immediate help, or it can also silently, asymptomatically lead to to floss. Orofacial pain in an emergency situation can also lead to tooth loss because sometimes the only way to resolve the problem is by pulling off teeth. This situation can cause pain, fever, because most of those problems, as you know, are infections, discomfort, leading to behavior issues, delirium due to infection, the necessity to wear dentures, and you know, some demented patients are not really able to do so, that will lead then to total edentalism that can hamper even more their social interactions, their eating ability, that will also restrict their diet and lead to nutritional problems. And if the infection is abundant in their mouth, they can be aspirated, leading to aspiration pneumonia. And all those things can reduce their quality of life. And how about periodontal disease? Well, gingivites, as you know, in some patients can develop it further into periodontal disease. But a hundred of the patients without proper oral hygiene will develop gingivites. Gingivites itself can harbor in their plaque buildups respiratory pathogens that can lead to aspiration pneumonia, atherosclerosis, and will hamper diabetes control. Or it can lead to periodontal disease that can lead to aspiration pneumonia, atherosclerosis, and poorer diabetes control. And all those things can bring our patients to a poor quality of life. Periodontal disease, though, can further progress to our facial pain in emergency situations and to loss by loss of bone support. Those conditions can lead to pain, fever, discomfort, behavior problems, delirium due to infection, uh, the necessity of wearing dentures that could not be an option for most of demented patients that will lead them to a dentalism, social, hampering social interactions, eating ability, <clears throat> reducing their food choice, maybe hampering their nutritional status, what will also reduce quality of life. So, it's pretty straightforward to see how poor oral health can lead to reduced quality of life. However, it's important to notice that there are other important oral health problems out there that are not only caries and periodontal disease. Our cognitively impaired patients usually suffer from dry mouth. Among older adults, xerostomia prevalence ranges from 12% to 39%, with an average of 21%. Medications really play an important role here, as many of them have xerostomia as a side effect, and they have synergistic xerostomic effects. Dry mouth sensation 
is proved to have an important effect on quality of life of our patients. Another common problem among elderly patients and demented patients are inflammatory lesions related to dentures. In this picture, we can see a denture stomatitis. That's the redness below uh, in a denture bearing area. And you can see here also the accumulation of um, white plaque formed by candida albicans. And it's not unusual for that to progress to the oral pharynx, bringing a life-threatening condition. And the traumatic ulcers related to poor fitting dentures as well as hyperplasic tissues related to poor fitting dentures. Another life-threatening condition is oral cancer. Oral cancer can have devastating consequences uh, if not diagnosed in an early stage. So early diagnosis is very important on oral cancer. And it can be done only with frequent dental appointments, frequent dental visits. So the dentist can recognize early signs of oral cancer and that will be treated in a much better way if diagnosed earlier. As we have discussed before, that's another representation of the elderly in art. This is, those were two different expositions uh, in the Cedar Rapids Museum of Art in the same day. So here we have a draw of an old lady where you can see that it's a dentalus person. And here, again, the beauty, usually yelp representation with an entirely different profile, very typical of a dentate patient. So it's impregnated in our society. And if we can avoid a dentalism, that will have great consequences, very good consequences for both systemic health and social interactions. So if we can agree that oral health is important for our demented patients, how to improve oral health for them? Well, there is four very easy ways to do that. First of all, provide systematic oral health to improve the quality of life. Second, promote oral hygiene at least twice a day to minimize the risk of remote infections. Third, provide regular dental appointment for checkups. And fourth, provide dental appointments when a patient shows or seems to show signs of oral pain that can be verbal or nonverbal. When a patient complains about oral dryness, when a patient complains about or shows denture-related oral soft tissue lesions or non-denture-related oral soft tissue lesions also. As we have talked about, oral care is very important. It's like feeding and bathing and must be promoted as an activity central to caring for older adults. How to do that? Providing daily oral hygiene routines, providing periodic dental appointments and emergency dental appointments when they are necessary. However, to promote oral hygiene at least twice a day, we need to know that different patients may need different oral hygiene procedures. <clears throat> this patient right here in your left hand side is a denture weather patient. That is a different oral hygiene routine when compared to this patient that's a dentate patient with a lot of fixed bridges. So let's talk about our dentate patients first. When we talk about dentate patients, we are talking about removing plaque from their tooth. That's the most important thing. 
mechanical removal of plaque from the tube surface. How we do that? Brushing. It can be done with electric toothbrushes that will make the work a little easier and faster. It can be done using manual, usual toothbrushes that may have special handles, may have adaptations to help a patient handle it, interproximal brushes and floss to help cleaning in between teeth. Okay, so the electric toothbrush one is a very good helper when we are taking care of several patients in a day because it makes your work faster. However, some patients are not able to cope with them. The vibration, the sounds will be so annoying for some demented patients, mainly if they have no experience with electric power toothbrushes before. So we should consider that, we should give that a try and see how patients handle it. Usually it's worth showing the patients into patients' nails first how that works, and if the patient is receptive, we can go ahead and do the toothbrushing. Some of our patients also are not able to handle a toothbrush, not because of their dementia, but because of other concomitant issues like arthritis. This patient in your left hand side is not able to handle a conventional toothbrush, but if we add a handle, a larger handle, they will be able to do so. And it's very important to try to promote their independence in daily living activities. So let's try handles instead. Okay, when our patients really need help, an interesting tip is to bend the toothbrush head so it will be easier for the caregiver to access different sites into patient's mouth when the caregiver is the one <clears throat> delivering the oral care. It's an easy thing to do, it's just a matter of warming up the head of the toothbrush in warm water and then bending them the way you would, you would prefer to deliver toothbrushing for your patients. Additional help can be obtained by using interproximal brushes or proxy brushes to clean in between the teeth and underneath fixed bridges. I know that using one more device is always troublesome. But some patients, mainly those ones that have extensive bridge work in their mouths, will really benefit from that. To clean in between patients' teeth, we can use proxy brushes as we have talked before, or we can floss in between their teeth. For flossing, we can have floss handles like that one, or we can use also Super floss that will help you guiding floss in between the teeth or underneath fixed bridges. Again, for patients that really have extensive fixed bridge work in their mouths, this is a this is a very important step. And in these cases, the super floss will be the one that will help if proxy brushes are not available. Okay, until now, we were talking about how to remove plaque from patient's tooth. That's a very important thing. I will say that's the most important thing. And now we are going to present to you with products that will help on controlling another factor in the caries etiology. Now we are switching from plaque to increasing the resistance or or making your teeth even harder and we do that using fluoride products there is a lot of fluoride products available some of them are over the counter but we you we usually recommend prescription toothpaste that will have five times the fluoride of over the counter toothpaste 
in some specific cases where controlling caries is really, really important. And we have several patients where caries development and caries risk are really high. And for those patients, this kind of product will be really helpful. But again, they need to be prescribed by a dentist. Okay, now let's talk about controlling this third factor on caries etiology, that's diet. So how can we do that? We can do that avoiding sugary foods and beverages that are easily metabolized by plague bacteria into acids that will promote tooth decay. Most of our patients will not receive regularly this kind of foods and beverages from their caregivers, but sometimes those are treats that people bring for them. So we should also be aware of that and try to control this consumption. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about specific products for periodontal disease control. Well, now we know that bacteria will play a very important role as well. So plaque removal, again, will be the most important thing. No matter what we do, if plaque is not removed mechanically by brushing every day, that's not gonna be successful. So what we are showing now, chemical products help preventing periodontal disease, but they are only complementary to tough brushing. With that I mean, if you have a patient that's really combative, where it's very difficult to have them brushing or doing brush for them, that's the patient where we should consider adding something else, an adjunctive product to help. But those products never replace plaque removal. They only help on plaque removal. So. The first line will be chlorhexidine solutions at 0.12% uh, concentration in a 15 milliliters for 30 to 60 second rings. They are very active against several types of bacteria and yeasts. They last longer than other mouthwashes, but they do cause a stain on teeth, tongue, gingiva, resin restorations, and dentures. So prolonged use can also reduce bitter and salt taste sensations, inducing dietary problems. But both plaque index and gingival inflammation are reduced significantly if associated to tooth brushing. What we usually do is tell caregivers to tooth brush using chlorhexidine rinses instead of toothpaste for patients in risk of periodontal disease development, at least for some period of time. Again, chlorhexidine should be prescribed by a dentist. Okay, I would like to reinforce that brushing teeth is the cheapest and most effective way of maintaining good auto health conditions for your dentate patients. You can do that using manually tooth brushes as you can see in this film. You can also do that using power tooth brushes, but the most important thing is that you should be prepared when providing auto hygiene care. You should decide where. Try to do that in a familiar place somewhere where your patient will be comfortable and there will be no environmental stresses. You should also decide when you are going to do that. You know better than nobody else. When is the best time for your patient to do that? When the patient is more calm and will be more receptive to the dental care. And you should also know how you will brush the resident's teeth. So have the toothbrush, toothpaste, or rinse product, and any other equipment you should need ready. Have your gloves on. 
Consider also whether you will need help from other CNAs or other helpers to control the patient behavior. Wash your hands, put your gloves on. Position the patient in a comfortable sitting wherever the patient will be feeling more comfortable and start doing the procedure. We know that, however, it's not that easy sometimes. Some patients will really present a challenging behavior. So we have several techniques to cope with that. The first technique will be rescuing. It's often used to help with completing hygiene tasks for residents with dementia. We can use the task breakdown technique. Think about all the small steps involved in brushing the teeth or cleaning dentures. Ask the resident to brush his or her teeth or clean his or her dentures. Observe which auto hygiene care steps the resident is able to do and which ones they require assistance. Encourage the resident to perform the steps the resident can do and assist with the steps the resident is unable to perform. It really promotes to know independence and dignity. You can also use distraction techniques. It involves placing a familiar item such as towel, cushion, or activity board in the resident hands during auto hygiene care. These items will help to distract the resident's attention from the task. Another thing you can use is familiar music to distract and relax the resident during auto hygiene care. A fourth technique will be bridging. It involves engaging the resident's senses, especially sight and touch, to help them understand the task you are trying to do for them. So, placing a toothbrush or denture in the resident hands can trigger you know, their memory and many residents will then start to brush their own teeth after holding a tough brush for a few minutes. However, never give a tough brush to a very aggressive resident who is likely to throw it or use it inappropriately. You can always have the hand over hand technique. It's a technique that can help to improve sensory awareness of the task. <clears throat> the caregiver places his or her hand over the residence and then starts to brush, to do the movements of toothbrushing and remove or replace dentures. Another technique that can be really helpful is chaining. It means other caregiver begins the auto hygiene task uh, and the resident can finish it. Some other techniques involve good use of verbal and non-verbal communication. So always approach residents slowly at eye level. Build trust with familiar conversation. Use a gentle touch when approaching the resident. Smile while interacting with them. Talk to the person like you are talking with an adult. Avoid elder speak. You can always give gestures to cue the desired behavior. And always explain what you, you are doing and assume that the resident will understand more than he or she is able to express. Remember, if attempts at auto hygiene care are not going well, walk away and have another caregiver completing the task. This technique usually works pretty well 
with some uncooperative residents. If a resident verbally refuses oral hygiene care, so then review what strategies were used and improve their use or try other strategies in the next time. Try again later. Sometimes just, just a matter of timing. At a different time or at a different place, residents can have a much more receptive behavior. Ask another nurse or another caregiver to help you on doing the task. And ask relatives if they had any special strategies for providing the residents oral hygiene care. Sometimes they do. Danger weather patients, as we have talked before, will need a different approach. They don't need tooth plaque removal. They need denture plaque removal. What's uh, way easier? Because you don't need to do that into patient's mouth. And I will tell you, you don't, you can not do that into patient's mouth. You need to remove dentures to do that. So it's interesting in that you can see in this picture that we are using a denture brush and not a regular toothbrush. Denture brushes do have higher bristles that will, you know, reach the inner surfaces of the denture and they will have a larger amount of bristles as well, but will make your work faster. Do that in a sink with some water in it. So if the denture drop, that's not going to broke. <clears throat> Do that for both outer and inner denture surfaces. You can also use adjunctive chemical methods to help denture plaque removal. Again, those are not substitutes to brushing. They just help you doing so. I mean, they have to be used complementary to denture brushing. Again, brushing is the most important measure to keep plaque away from both tooth and dentures. For an edentulous patient, we also need to clean their gums. So wrap a gauze around a finger and rub gently the edentulous mucosa. Of course, you should be wearing gloves to do so. And then you can remove food debris and plaque accumulation over patient's mucosa. Another important step is to provide regular dental appointments for checkups. Regular dental appointments are very important to avoid rapid auto health deterioration, mainly in patients that present with lots of crowns and fixed bridges where cavities are not easily visualized. They can be underneath those prosthetic devices. So only the dentist will be able to see them and avoid rapid auto health deterioration as it has happened for this patient. Regular dental appointments are also important to allow detection of oral cancer in an early stage where they usually look like white or red or white and red patches into patient mouth. Remember, those are asymptomatic lesions that may affect both dentate and edentate patients. And if they progress to larger and more destructive cancer lesions, their consequences could be devastating for the patient's quality of life. Whenever a patient <coughs> are showing or seems to show signs of oral pain, like neglecting to eat, being disinterested of favorite foods, chewing of the lip, tongue or hands, pulling at the face or mouth, not wearing their dentures, grinding 
their teeth or dentures, aggression, a more aggressive behavior, and alterations in activity level that could be both more agitated or less agitated. Please think on possible dental problems and provide dental appointments for them. It's also interesting to provide dental appointments when a resident is complaining about mouth dryness because we can provide relief by several products. Some of them are over the counter, easily to buy spray bottles that they can be spraying water in their mouths during the day and also some not that easily available uh, auto health care products that will help them keeping their mouth moist at night, like <clears throat> some gels and other in interesting products available in the dental market. Management of dry mouth, though, is not only about symptom relief, although that's a very important goal. We also need to manage problems with dentures as saliva is a very important factor, factor on denture retention and stability. We should think on methods to prevent dental caries and soft tissue lesions. And we can also talk with other providers trying to monitor the use of medication and maybe changing some medication regimens. Please think also on providing dental appointments when a patient complains about or shows dental or non-dental related auto soft tissue lesions. They, those could be located in several different sites like lips, edentulous ridges, they can be widespread as denture stomatites or can be localized as some kind of denture related lesions. We covered how important cognitive impairment can be on progression of oral diseases and how oral diseases can impact the quality of life of cognitively impaired patients. However, very recent research is showing that oral health may be also a risk factor for cognitive impairment progression. They are usually studies using epidemiological data, which rely on correlation analysis, and so far cannot prove any causal relationship right now. I am going to show you some very recent research uh, about this topic. Well, this is a Journal of American Geriatric Society paper published in 2012, where we are looking to a sample of about 5,468 patients that are non-demented in the beginning of the experiment and from in a period from 1992 to 2010 1,145 patients developed a dementia diagnosis and the rest of the patients has a no dementia diagnosis. So when comparing those groups regarding their auto health, the researchers were able to see that men with inadequate natural masticatory function who did not wear dentures had a 91% greater risk of dementia than those with adequate natural masticatory function. Natural masticatory function was considered 10 or more than 10 upper teeth and inadequate masticatory function were considered 6 or less than 6 tooth. Dentate individuals who reported not brushing their teeth daily had a 20 2% to 65% greater risk of dementia than those who brushed three times daily. So they look at <clears throat> four, two important relationships. One is tooth loss and dementia. 
And the other one is oral hygiene and dementia. And their conclusion is, in addition to helping maintain natural health, functional teeth, oral health behaviors are associated with lower risk of dementia in older adults. Again, I would like to highlight that those results are not conclusive right now because they are based only in, co uh, in correlational analysis. Same thing holds true to this study about periodontites and its association with cognitive impairment among all older adults. So they look at to a sample of 2,355 patients that are older than 60 years and provided cognition tests and blood samples of antibodies to Porphyromonas gingivalis, that is a periodontal uh, gingival pathogen. Their conclusion is that a serological marker for periodontites, the, anti the antibody to Porphyromonas gingivalis, was associated with impaired, delayed memory and calculation. So again, it's just a correlational study, but they are pointed to the same kind of relationship. So, how oral health and cognitive impairment may correlate? What could be the causal relationship among oral health and progression of cognitive impairment? Well, this article recently published came up with a theory that environmental and genetic risk factors and inattention to oral health care can cause caries and periodontal disease. Caries and periodontal disease can cause tooth loss and periodontal disease due to uh, inflammatory response with increased inflammatory markers and bacterial triggered arterogenesis can cause cognitive impairment. And both caries and periodontal disease can cause tooth loss that will reduce masticatory efficiency and will have an adverse dietary effect that can also cause cognitive impairment. And as we know, cognitive impairment will cause, you know, inattention to oral health care in a cycle that is very vicious and we can avoid by simple measures as we have seen before. Which measures are those? Well, the most important one is brushing demented patients' teeth at least twice a day and have it done in the best possible way. In addition to that, provide specific dental appointments when patients have emergency needs and regular dental appointments in a fairly constant, frequent basis. So the patients will have constant dental assessment, constant dental care. Those are the most important things. Those are the bottom line. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope that lecture brought you some new information and add up to your knowledge. Have a wonderful day.